Lord, we thank you for 75 amazing years. Lord, thank you for the men and women, Lord, who we stand on their shoulders today, Lord, the work that they've done, Lord. God, I pray that you would just give us even more, Lord, even more than 75 years, Lord. May our, our influence, may this light, Lord, go into this community, Lord, and far beyond what we even can expect, God. Lord, be with us today, Lord, as we say thank you for an, an awesome 75 years. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day when the lost are found. This is a day for a new beginning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Oh, can you hear all the angels are singing? And this is the day, the day when life begins. Can you hear it? The gentle voice of the Spirit. There's no reason to fear it. He's calling. Salvation has come and he is here. I've no fear. I've no fear. This is the day when the lost are found. This is your beginning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.
Why don't you just take a minute and give thanks to the Lord? We worship you, Jesus. I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real. 
that your wisdom would just shine through your house. And the Lord, that which the enemy throws at us, it would have no power over us, it would not hold us back, but God, we would move into that which you have called us to be. So Lord, we thank you for this opportunity today. We rejoice together. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen, amen. Now, before you're seated, I'm going to invite the kids to come this way. 
opportunity to pray with our kids before they go off to kids church so kids and as they are coming this way now you can be seated as they're coming this way good morning everybody great to see you great to see you good to see you good to see you good morning good morning good morning good morning good morning good morning everybody all right all right all right as these kids are coming forward just want to remind you that for the month of September we just decided that we wanted to try something new this opportunity to pray with our kids before they went off to uh, our kids church and an opportunity for them to join us in worship right and so I, I, I think you're liking this so far and uh, also today just as a reminder folks we start a brand new ministry called crossover it's to to middle school students primarily grades five six and seven and and those that are kind of on the bubble there in eighth grade as well but Jeremy and Levina, they are ready for you today, and they will be starting right after service here this morning as well. So let's pray together. Everyone, you got a good voice in there? Let's pray. At congregation, why don't you pray with us? Here we go. Dear Jesus, thank you for this special day, because it's the day you have made. And so we're going to be glad and happy about it, and even rejoice a little. Be with all of our services today, for the young and the not so young. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the whole church said, amen. amen. Goodbye, boys and girls. We'll see you later. Off you go. We'll see you all later. And as the kids are going out, folks, would you take a moment? I know you've already sat down, but would you take a moment to say hello to the people next to you as we just take this one minute to get our kids going in the right direction this morning. Our ushers are going to help them out, see them out this morning. All right, all right. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Out you go this morning, out you go this morning. God bless you. Great to see you, great to see you. I got to tell you, I am enjoying praying with our kids be, uh, before they go off. It's, um, it's good. It's really good. It's really good. All right, let me talk to you about uh, pre preparing for our, our tithe and offering this morning. In, in 1 Kings chapter 17, there's a, the story of God providing for uh, for a lady who, well, she's a little bit down on her luck. And that's a bit of an understatement, frankly. See, after three and a half years of drought, God sent this, Elijah, uh, sent this prophet Elijah to her region. And this lady had been living in incredible financial fear. Now, before I go any farther, do you know financial fear is a very real thing that people struggle with? Did you know that? They're very consumed about, I'm not going to have enough. Or I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. And in her case, she wasn't going to have enough to buy any more food. In fact, she was going to live on that which was left in her cupboards. And she was going to make a little bit of bread for her and her family. And then they were basically going to start the process of starving to death. And then this, this crazy prophet shows up one day and says to her, Hey, I want you to make some bread. But before you do anything with that bread, I want you to give me my portion first. And you know, it, it, sometimes you got to think, well, that's kind of a bold statement, isn't it? That's kind of a, um, maybe almost selfish sounding. But folks, I want to remind you that, that Elijah was God's representative and was teaching his people again that despite the circumstances, that God is still first. And God can do more with what you have left than what you can do in your totality. And so she didn't back down from that, and perhaps she had some doubt even as she was baking this bread, because, you know, we bake bread today, and it goes a little bit faster, but in their case, uh, it was a process that took a, certainly a whole lot more time, so she had some time to think and to process, 
But she does exactly what the prophet asks, and she gives to him first. And, and, and I don't know about the level of doubt that she may have had, but I suspect she got to a place where she said, what do I have to lose? And folks, I know that some of us, when we just we play the merry, on the merry-go-round of financials ups and downs, I just want to encourage you that if you've not taken steps of faith to be obedient and give first unto the Lord, then I want to encourage you today to, to get off that merry-go-round, per se, and, and just be diligent and, and just begin to move in obedience to God first, despite that which is going on all around us. You know, I imagine that for this woman, as she, after she saw the miracle of God, that she was never the same spiritually. And, and she had only known God at a distance, but now she knew him as her personal provider. And folks, God still does that. Do you know that? God still does that. I am a testimony to that. Many of you are a testimony to that, that God makes a way where there seems to be no other way. He takes care of us personally. He reaches out to us where we are on that merry-go-round wondering and where we, where we lack faith, and he says to us, trust me. You know, a few observations. She was a believer. She had serious financial need. She asked to give away a part of the little she had. She heard God's promise to provide for her. She believed it, and she, and she was the recipient of his care as he made a way miraculously. Folks, today I want to remind you, and what a great day to remind you as we celebrate 75 years of ministry, that Jesus is the same yesterday. Jesus is the same today, and Jesus is the same forever. And so if you are just struggling financially today in my boldest but most kind uh, admonition to you, step out in faith today. Step out in faith. I know many of you give on a regular basis, but for some there's just that fear, and I want to encourage you today that uh, God first in all we do. With that in mind, if you'd reach down at the end of the aisle, Grab that bucket, hold it for just a moment, and we are going to receive this morning's tithe and offering together. Let's pray. Father, you are the author of all things. And Lord, today, as many sometimes get to that point where they struggle with the ups and downs and the financial fear that comes into their lives because of, well, cir cir circumstances and situations and, and some of our own making and others inflicted upon us, the God we choose to trust and believe as we honor you first that you will make a way where there seems to be no way possible. And Lord, that is the type of faith that we need to stand on as a church in order to move forward in that which you've called us to be. And Lord, today, every dollar, every dime, use it for your ministry purposes, for your kingdom good. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Pass it along the aisles, and we have some announcements, as well as the spiritual care video we want to show you this morning. God bless you. Good morning, church. Here are this week's updates. Please mark your calendars for our trust and estate planning luncheon for Sunday, September 28th, immediately following service. If you are interested in attending this event, you must RSVP, so mark your connection cards. Saturday evening services are back. Beginning September 20th at 6 p.m., we will begin meeting in the box. We hope to see you there. Next week is our first meeting Sunday, which is an opportunity for our SJA ministries to conduct meetings after service. We also are offering membership class to all who want to call SJA their home. Church, leaders, please plan to join us for lunch and then you are free to conduct your department meeting as needed. Mark your connection cards so we can count you in for this lunch. Lastly, Hooked is back, our fishing affinity group We'll meet Saturday, September 27th at Lake Hemet at 7 a.m. Please see Mark Malore at the gazebo following service today to sign up. You can also mark your connection card for more information. Thank you, church, for tuning in to this week's updates. And please don't forget to silence your cell phones. Have a great day. Baggage. For as long as we've had stuff... We found ways to bring it along. 
bag it started off big, but it got smaller, portable. Now one person can carry more than ever. Important stuff like clothes, toiletries, fancy little dogs, you know, necessities. But what's amazing is how much stuff we drag around that we don't need and don't like. Things that trip us up, wear us out, and box us in. Stuff like anger. What is wrong with you? Addiction. Overeating. And overspending. It was amazing. They had such great sales. I couldn't believe it. We carry around past relationships. I don't know what I ever saw in you. I don't even dress well. Gosh. Worry. Unforgiveness. And selfishness. I think that's a great idea, don't you? I love it. It makes us ask questions like... Why did I do that? Or how did I get here? And what is wrong with me? Because this stuff is heavy. It's bulky. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It makes everything in life harder, especially relationships. You might not know where it came from or how you got it, but there's only one way to deal with baggage. Throw it down. Drop it. Just let go. Sounds easy, but it's not. You carry something long enough, it feels like a part of you. You walk away, but a minute later, it's back in your hand. Bag is tricky like that. You gotta keep dropping, keep throwing, keep letting go, so you can take hold of something better. God's best for your life. And for that, you're going to need both hands. Good morning, everyone. You guys don't look bad for 75. I was thinking about that this morning as I was preparing. I was thinking, we, we got some folks that are older than 75, and they look pretty cool. There's a few, yeah. You know what's the nice thing about having a food reception after a service? We can have a real long service and you're all going to stay. <laughs> we are here to celebrate 75 years of this church being in existence. There's a whole lot of work that was done to get us today to today, and there's a whole lot of work that's going to be done in the future. You know, we're going to be talking about uh, where we've been, where we are, and the capstone of this whole service is going to be our pastor talking about where we're going and where you have a part in that. You know, just like... Just like on a farm, you get to a field and all the hard work is first, you got to break through the hard ground. And then you plant the seed and then you water it and then the harvest comes. You know, there's been a lot of hard work that's been done prior to us. And today is a changing of seasons in the life of this church. How many needs a fresh start in your life? Okay? You're going to find out today that it's no coincidence that God brought you to this church for this time because you have a part to play you have a purpose to play and God's going to reveal that to you today so as I said before we have a standard reception after this morning uh, real quickly what I wanted to do and I wanted everybody to know you know when it comes to 75 years it's really hard to acknowledge everyone so if we miss somebody just give us some grace today, okay? Is that good? Are we good? Okay. I want to uh, just very quickly compliment and thank the committee team that put this event together today. All the work that you're going to see that's done in the box, the food, the cupcakes, the, the uh, everything. Weeks and weeks and weeks and months worth of work. The committee, uh, I would like to thank them, Ken and Pam Radke, Joe and Tina Aragon, Rick and Susan Barnes, Donda Cox, Karen Fuller, Vern and Kathy Jackson, Frankie Youssef, 
Leanna Millar, Evelyn Snyder, Donna Jarvis, Crystal, if I say your name wrong, I'm sorry, Kappel. Kappel, I'd like to thank all of you guys for putting this together. It's a wonderful thing. So we're talking about 1939, and I always like to start with something that connects us with the time frame. So here we go, 1939, the Baseball Hall of Fame opens up. And this is this is this next one I have here specifically for our pastor, because we know they're from the Great North. Um, King George the Sixth and Queen Elizabeth arrived in Quebec City to begin the first ever tour of Canada by Canada's monarch. 1939. Okay, some other funny ones. Nylon stockings went on sale for the first time. 1939. <laughs> Who was born this year? Lee Majors. You remember Six Million Dollar Man? Can you believe it? He's 75. Tina Turner. No way. <laughs> and my all-time favorite when it comes to sports issues. In 1939, it had been 31 years since the Cubs had won the World Series. And today, nothing has changed. It's been 106 years since the Cubs have won the World Series. Superman was the new daily comic strip, and for the first time ever, an air-conditioned car was put out on the market. What did we do before that? Okay, here's something you can really connect with. The average annual income in 1939, $1,368. The average cost for a new car, $750. The average cost for a new home, $4,000. A gallon of milk was 23 cents. It was probably better milk back then, too. A gallon of gas was 10 cents. <laughs> and finally, a loaf of bread was 9 cents. And that bread was probably better, too. So I'm going to start out here with, uh, as we move forward with this first section about where we've been, and I'm also going to be covering one of our most influential pastors that we had here. He was here for 20 years. I'll be talking about him in just a couple of minutes. But I want to read a letter to you that came to us from the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God. So this is like getting a letter from the President of the Assemblies of God. Okay, this is addressed to uh, Pastor Jeff Johnson, lead pastor. Greetings in the name of the Lord. Heartfelt congratulations on the 75th anniversary celebrating your church. I'm grateful that the founders of San Jacinto Assembly, who had the original vision and burden to plant your church 75 years ago, they started with very little resources. But the Lord multiplied, just like he did with the five loaves and the two fish, the Lord multiplied. He's multiplied his work through you and, through, and in San Jacinto. Your church is a vital part of the nationwide and worldwide fellowship of Assemblies of God. We are seeing an unprecedented harvest in evangelism in the United States and in the world. In, and it's all happening because churches like ours have joined heart and hand with the 12,800 Assembly of God churches to fulfill the great commission uh, that Jesus has given all of us. And he goes on to say that uh, let it be a part of the DNA of our, of our church that we continue to go outside the four walls of the church and reach those people that are in our community, in our state, and in the nation. And so that is from uh, George W. Wood, signed George W. Wood, General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God. Thank God for that. Isn't that awesome? So... The San Jacinto Assembly of God Church has been an integral part of the city for 75 years. When it came into existence in 1939, the Assemblies of God themselves were only 25 years old. Once you get an understanding of that, about how close this church was to the, uh, the, the beginning of one of the largest Pentecostal movements in the world. The humble beginnings started uh, with services being held at the old theater. If you could pull up slide three. Oh, one back, one back. So this is Main Street. This is a couple blocks away from us. 
We're, we're at five corners. We're looking north. We're, I'm sorry, we're looking west on Main Street. And if you can take a look, this is, this is 1939. If you can take a look at the largest building on the left-hand side, it's kind of peeking out there down at the end. That was the old movie theater on uh, Pico, and that's where, the, that's where the church started. And the pastors actually lived in the rooms there, in the back of the rooms, the changing rooms for the theater. So we are an integral part of the history of this city. A young Lester Davis was called to be the first pastor of our church. His services were known to last till, let's see if you like this one. His services were known to last till 2 to 3 in the morning with many salvations and baptisms in the Holy Spirit. So who's coming back next week? It was later in 1939 during a prayer meeting pastor, at Pastor Davis's home located at 160 Ramona Boulevard. If you pull up that next slide, you'll see the top orange pointer up there, and you'll see the bottom orange over to the right. That's where the church is at. 160 North Ramona is now the front of San Jacinto Elementary School, and that's where his house was at, right across the street. They were having a prayer meeting, and during that prayer meeting in 1939, the, 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 this piece of property that I'm about to show you right now actually became available. If you can pull up that next slide, you'll see here that you can see where the main church is at over to the top right hand side. That piece of property right there with the orange around it was actually the property that was purchased by the church in 1939. It was purchased for $1,467.36. It took seven years to pay off. The church had to pay the city $3.50 for a building permit. And all of this was started with $30 in the treasury. Now, one of the most interesting stories about the building, the, the, the building of this building is the night the church put in the footings and they were getting ready to pour the concrete, the community, some of the neighbors didn't like the fact that some holy rollers were going to be moving into the community. So that night, they went out in the middle of the night and they tore up all the footings. The, the story's good, okay? The next day, the church went out, fixed everything, re-poured, and the building was built. So what we see here is, is that we see what the picture that I want you to get today is that as God began to develop the campus of San Jacinto Assembly, Without that vision from leaders developing and expanding the campus, this church would not be what it is today because we're being prepared for something. Okay, in 1946, the church pur purchased the east lot for parking facilities. That's that next slide, if you can pull that up. That's the slide right now where we have all the kids' equipment, and they're out there, and they got, you know, the jungle gym and all that stuff. That was the next lot that was purchased in 1946 for $1,355, okay? Now, the next thing that took place under Pastor Hansen's time here at the church was the first remodeling. Um, if you take a look at slide seven, you'll see here there's, it, it's kind of hard to see on these screens, but there's a dotted line. The back side of where the kids' church is at is a two-story annex that was added to that building. That was actually done in, in, in the late 1940s under Pastor Hansen, and it completed that first portion of the building for a cost of $15,000. In 1968, let's go to the 1965, let's go to the next slide. This is what the front of the church looked like in the middle of the 60s. Doesn't look like it does today. Let's go to the next one. This is kind of what it looks like today. It's the same front, but you can see they've totally design, uh, redesigned the front of it. On the back side is where they've put the two-story office building. From 1939 to 1968, the campus of San Jacinto Assembly was growing. Church attendance peaked at 150 people. But something changed in 1968. Let's go to the next slide. Here are all your pastors from 1938 to 1968. There are nine pastors listed there. And if you go to the next slide, 
the average stay was 3.33 years. Next slide. But something takes place in 1968. After 30 years, God redesigns the model of leadership at San Jacinto Assembly. Lee Coffey, 1968 to 1989, 20 years. First time a pastor had stayed here that long. Gordon and Nanda Houston, 1989 to 2008, 19 years. What's important, what's important to understand is that God spent the first 30 years laying the groundwork of what this church was going to be and expanding the campus, but then God began to do a new thing. And this is all leading up to where we are today. Remember, the Lord had this work planned long before any of us were here. So the coffees, uh, go to the next slide. The coffees were here 68 to 89, and I want to talk, I want to talk a little bit about them first. They arrived in 68. The attendance was down to about 40 people. Over the next two years, they grew their Sunday school to about 100 people. The big boosters in our church that helped get the attendance up were Lauren Winans and Keith Abraham. Now, Keith Abraham, which I'm going to show this next picture here just in a minute. We can pull that up. There's Pastor Coffee over in the center, right, ne right to the left of the, the, the lady there. But over to the far right, where are the Abrahams at this morning? Does that picture look familiar? That is Keith Abraham, dad and grandfather to the, to the Abraham family. And, the, and, and he was a part of the leadership of this church back in the 70s. So... These guys have been around for a while. Um, August 24th, 1974, a membership uh, voted in to purchase the West property. So uh, for $4,700, uh, the church pur purchased another parcel for $13,000. If you take a look at slide S15, you'll see where the uh, youth building is now and the, and the lot directly west to it are the two are the two plots that were actually purchased during the 70s. So I hope I'm painting the picture here for you that God started out with something very small here. And no one knew what the future looked like at that moment when Pastor Davis bought that first plot. But as you can see, the campus continued to grow and grow. Ministries start, began to grow and grow and grow. See, you can really connect your own life with what God is doing here. Because he starts you off with the small things, and he continues to build and move you on. It was also during the year, and this is a critical, this is a critical piece here. Uh, during 1974, the church acquired 1.7 acres from the school district. Let's go ahead and put that up. If you see all the way up here on the top, there's an orange outline around what used to be the skate park. And then you have what is the uh, We Care building and then a big parking lot. So what used to be there, that parking lot used to be the high school gym. And let me give you a, just a tad bit of history on here. The, the bell tower that is across the street represented the first high school in all of Riverside County. The high school goes back to the 1800s. If you go out and you look at the stone fence that goes along the property, along 1st Street, you will find that in that stone fence, there are all kinds of names written in the concrete. You will see people like uh, uh, President Roosevelt's signature in there. People from all over the world came to San Jacinto to, to, to not only see the valley, but to sign their signature in this little stone wall that's right across the street. That bell tower was the was was the gateway into the San Jacinto High School before it moved. The original gymnasium was on that parking lot. And if any of you go to the San Jacinto Unified School District uh, board meetings, you will see a centerpiece from a uh, basketball court. We cut it out of the floor, out of the gym. We had it mounted. We had it re, re, uh, refurnished. And we gave it to the school district. That's how much a part 
of our church is a part of the integral part of the history of the city of San Jacinto. So we're not just here by mistake, folks, and you're not here by mistake. Some of the highlights of Pastor Coffey's uh, tenure here for 20 years. He doubled the size of the SJA campus. He helped launch Val Vista Assembly of God, started, starting with Pastor Randy and Nancy Jones. He doubled the size of church attendance. And he was honored for 20 years of positive Christian influence in the city of San Jacinto by local government. So much so that in 1989, the mayor of San Jacinto actually proclaimed, there was a day in March that it was proclaimed Lee Coffee Day in the city of San Jacinto. So I want, I, want, I, want you to, I want you to grab the idea that you're a part of something special here. So we've covered the first pastor who stayed here for 20 years. We've covered the groundwork of where we've been. And now I'm going to call up Joe Aragon and Ken Radke, and we're going to talk about the Houston years, 20 years, 1989 to 2008. Wow, this is kind of humbling here. A lot of history, huh? You got to put it on, on, brother. Hello. Everybody hear me? All right. Good morning. Wow, exciting times. You know, I was, I was sitting over there with my wife, and, and I was saying, what an honor and a privilege it is to be able to give this, this historical uh, backdrop and, and background on, on our heritage here, considering what's going on in the world. You know, we have a great privilege to be able to have our religious uh, liberties and freedoms, don't we, considering what's happening in the Middle East. Um, Go ahead, Ken. Ah, good morning to all of you. Um, in case somebody here doesn't know who I am, my name is Ken Radke. Uh, my wife is Pam, which probably a lot of more people know her than me. Uh, but I was blessed when I was asked to talk a little bit here um, because I do have a few parts in the 75, actually to be one third of it, because I've been here almost 26 years. So, uh, But um, I was here when Pastor Houston, Gordon, uh, G, as a lot of us know him, um, he was still a youth pastor. I wasn't here for a very long time on that, but he, uh, him and his bride, originally in 1985, they drove down the town of San Jacinto. They started from one end, they seen the church, and they just kept driving. They drove all the way to Idaho and they had lunch and they go, no way. Well, lo and behold, God knows how to get our attention and they wrestled with God for quite a while because back in, uh, or it got to the year 1989, they finally took on, or the, it was 86, they took on as youth pastors, and they stayed youth pastors until about 1989. And then a strange thing happened. He decided to wrestle with God again. And God wanted him to be senior pastor here. And if anybody has ever argued with God, you know who usually wins. <laughs> but uh, he was voted in at that time at a young age of 29, and he was voted almost unanimously to be senior pastor here. He was the first and the youngest pastor at the Senate Assembly to ever be voted in as a pastor senior at that age. Um, after accepting that, um, he began his main ministries, which was community outreach. 
So he started the school, which some of you may know, as a school of ministry, was developed the High Calling Ministry Institute, which HCMI, which was a two-year program here in the, in the church to get your some, some of you went through that, uh, that HCMI program. If you have, raise your hands. Yeah, who has? Right? We've got quite a few here. Amen. And from that point, um, he just started adding new ministries, and some of the ministries are, are rather unique, which is at this point in time, I'm going to. I'm going to stretch it over to, to uh, Joe to kind of set off the Bro ministry. Brother, brother, why are you hitting me with a rubber band, man? Because it's, it's a human rubber band. It's the one that you learn to get that was a, That was the theme, right? That was, that was the a theme during that time yes, frame, you know, during the, the, the Houston era, was that we were, human, we were human rubber bands. We were being stretched for the Lord. Amen. And when God is calling you, don't wrestle with him. Because we know who's going to win. But the stretching, it hurts, doesn't it? Amen. It's the stretching hurts because our flesh wants to say no. We want to resist. We want things our way in our timing. But God is saying, you know what? Just be obedient. Just be obedient because I want to bless you. And by being obedient comes great blessings and rewards, amen? You know, Ken was talking about some of the uh, outreach ministries. And, and for me personally, for the Aragons, my, my wife, Tina, and, and my son, Josh, and Elisa, we got here in 89, and we spent a few months with the coffees before Pastor Gordon and Onda were elected as senior pastors. And, and, you know, just on a personal note, I was driving down Ramona Expressway, and I could have sworn it never ended, you know, because I came from L.A. County, and we didn't have cows. You know, we, we didn't have alfalfa. And I was like, what is that smell? You know, what is that smell? I kept looking over to the back of the kids. And, what did you guys do back there? You know? And, uh, and of course, they were looking at me, too, you know? Um, Christian Columbus. But, but uh, in, in, in 89, 90, during that time frame, the transition between the Coffees and the Houstons, they were called. For such a time of those 19 years. And if there's two words, like Ken referenced, if there's two words that identify what the leadership and the administration was all about, their mission statement during that 19-year leadership, it was community outreach. You know, ministries that you've, that you've heard about, adopt a block, taking ownership of city blocks, See, if we go back in history, you'll notice that it was the church that spearheaded social services. They didn't pass it on to a federal, federal branch or a federal government. The church was it. The church took responsibility. The church was the one that set the example. The church was the one that modeled what needed to be done. And so through starting a ministry like Adopt-A-Block, that's exactly what was being displayed. The church took ownership, took blocks, had, had laborers out there cleaning up yards, mowing lawns, picking up trash, very much so like we continue today under the leadership of Pastor Jeff where we recently go out into the community, right? But now we're doing it different. We're partnering with other churches, amen? Because there's power in numbers, right? I mean, what a great opportunity, what a great opportunity, not only for a single church to go out and minister, but for now the whole body of Christ to jump on board, unified, and doing what God has called us to do. You know, the San Jacinto High School football team, the breakfasts, you know, those of you that are in here, some of you got up at 3.30 in the morning to be here at 4.30 to get those hash browns and eggs going. And that chorizo and eggs, right? It's not easy getting up at 3 or 4 in the morning to cook for a, uh, quite a few hungry football players. But guess what? It was done. It was done consistently. And what a great witness, huh? What a great witness to the coaches. Too. 
oh yeah, oh yeah, those boys can eat. You know, they like that protein. But what a great witness it was to the coaches, right? Yeah. And, and, and the staff and the faculty over at San Jacinto High School. And, and, and matter of fact, we had some of the administrative staff, some of the principals, the superintendent, the, uh, the, uh, the assistant principal, they attended our church. Why? Because of the outreach ministries that were established during that time frame. You want to add anything about that? You know, I just never figured out how anybody could play football. It's too much pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of the other ministries that, that, uh, that fell uh, under the category of outreach was the baccalaureate, right? Yeah. Initially, the baccalaureate was for San Jacinto High School. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. For the San Jacinto High School graduates. But what we've seen is that now it's for all Valley graduates, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, I mean, praise God, right? Yeah, yeah. give the Lord a clap. Give the Lord a clap because what we're starting to see now, we're seeing the body of Christ. It's not just San Jacinto Assembly. It's the body, it's the body of Christ within the San Jacinto Valley that is displaying outreach, discipleship, right? The witness. Also, Pastor Gordon, I don't know how many of you know it, but he used to be the uh, special teams coach for the kickers. And we actually have... I know there's one for sure that actually took the record, and he actually started playing college, and I think he beat the record in the college, too, for yeah. kicking. And he was a kid who didn't even like football. He played soccer. So Yeah, he actually got a scholarship at UNLV. Yes, got a complete scholarship yeah, for it. Yeah, UNLV. Amen. Uh, some of the other ministries uh, that, that uh, was under that uh, administration was uh, bicycle helmets for the students. Uh, of the students in San Jacinto School District. We, uh, we bought all the bicycle helmets for all the students. Uh, we also bought flashlights and, and first aid kits for all of the San Jacinto recorders. Police Department and recorders, right? For first. San Jacinto Police Department officers, law enforcement. Uh, we, we're real big about reaching out to our law enforcement. Um, Holy Rollers, Amen. right? The Holy Roller Ministry was a ministry where we provided transportation for those individuals who were wheelchair bound. And let me tell you, that ministry, I mean, what a great ministry it was, but it was tough sometimes um, doing that ministry when the actual vehicle's air conditioning broke down. You know, I mean, when a ministry is moving forward in spite of those challenges, Right? In spite of the obstacles, in spite of the challenges. I mean, I, I can't remember the name of the couple uh, that headed up that ministry. Do you remember? Jerry and Sharon. Yeah, the Woodards. Yeah, the yes. Woodards. Jerry and yeah. Sharon Woodard. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, God put it on their, on their hearts to start that ministry. And, and we, had, we used to have a full row of individuals that were wheelchair bound. They were brought here. And because of the ministry, they were able to participate and engage in the service. New building, 2002, right? Yep, new building was built in, or started in 2002. And we have a couple pictures. Mm -hmm. um, that's the inside, that's the front of the building. But the one I really like is the one where the Bible and everything is in the ground. Do you have a picture of that? I believe, uh, yeah, I believe the name on that, her parents are in this audience. Yeah. I, they, Is that, they that's Tamri Miller, right? Yeah. But in, we, wrote, we wrote on it over there, right, to the left? Yeah, it was actually that right? the overflow. All over, huh? Okay. Oh, the whole church, that's right. Yeah, right. the whole church. But the really neat thing about the new building in the foundation is we put a hole in the middle of the foundation and we put all the things that are a necessity, like a Bible and our proclamation of the community. and The seven was, ways that Jesus, Jesus uh, right, shed uh, his blood, right? Jabez, yeah. Jabez prayer. Um, and then it was covered with a... What's that, Keith? Right. Okay, great. Great. And Thank then, you, Keith. Uh, Tallet was put over that, plastic over that, and then it was all in the, the 
foundation. So we have a firm foundation here. So, so years. we kind of highlighted some of the some of the external uh, outreach. Uh, what was going on during the 19-year ministry under the Houston's for uh, the congregation? Some of the ministries that that were initiated was Men of Action, a, a big, strong uh, men's ministry movement. Now, keep in mind, nationally and even internationally, there was a movement happening with the men, and that was known as Promise Keepers. Okay, some of you went to a lot of Promise Keepers conferences, right? But internally, we had a strong movement happening within the men because the philosophy was if you build a strong man, you build a strong marriage. If you build a strong marriage, you build a strong family. If you build a strong family, you build a strong what? Church. If you build a strong church, you build a strong community, right? It's that ripple effect, and it all starts with the men as the priests of their homes. And so, well, get, get the Lord a clap on that one, right? Also started a single mom's. Single um, mom's ministry, right? Single mom's ministry. Reaching out to the single moms and their children, right? Illustrated sermons. Illustrated, illustrated sermons. How many of you remember the, the carcass that was on the, pat, the, the back of Pastor Gordon during that service? Right? Um, the, the three vials, right? Representing the blood of Jesus, washing of sin, right? Um, the golf cart that was dr uh, driven up on the stage. You guys remember that, right? So a lot of illustrated sermons, right? Uh, Monday, night full, uh, Monday Night Madness, right? Uh, marriage retreats. Some of you in here went on marriage retreats. And, of course, some of the uh, uh, Super Bowl parties, right? Super Bowl parties, right? And, of course, all the football fans appreciated that, right? Last but not least, along with the, the human rubber band, a couple of other uh, catchphrases during the Houston's uh, uh, years of service was the philosophy that if you see a need, meet it. If you see a need, is God putting that on your heart? Then do something about it. And Pastor Jeff's going to cast vision shortly. And you know what? That's what it's all about. Where do you play? Where's your position in what God wants to do in the next 75 years? Right? If you see someone down, give them a hand up. Yeah. Right? And I personally believe God wants you in the middle because I believe, you know what, we're all weak sometimes and we're all strong. So as we're weak, we have somebody lifting us up. And when we're strong, we're lifting somebody else up. Amen? So I always want to be in the middle. I want to be picked up and I want to be ministering to somebody else and picking them up. Amen? With that, uh, the Houstons, they, uh, they got a call to move on to district which is in Irvine, and uh, at that point, we didn't have a pastor. And Pastor uh, Chris Kerrigan, who was here as a pastor, associate pastor, yeah. we asked him if he would take the reins and, and go with it to keep us together, keep us stable until we found a new pastor, and he graciously accepted that. And he did a great job for almost a year, at which time Pastor Jeff came on board, which... <laughs> I know he, he doesn't want me to say this, but, I mean, isn't he looking sharp? Huh? I think we should vote that he has the suit every Sunday. <laughs> Birds here. Um, many years ago, uh, an artist wrote a song, Ray Bolt, thank you for giving to the Lord. And I would just like to say, from the bottom of my heart to each and every one of you, if you've given a glass of water to a thirsty person or if you've given them a hand up or 
if you've given somebody some money, you've given to the least. And Jesus said, if you give to the least, you've given to me. I want to thank each and every one of you for giving to the Lord because it touches God's heart. I know there's no crying in heaven, which is part of the song, but Jesus has tears in his eyes of joy every time you give a glass of water or hand up to somebody. So give yourself an applaud because you deserve it. All right. Well, you've heard we have quite a history and a very proud history as the Lord has been doing the work. And uh, you've also heard about uh, uh, many of the, the great pastors. Well, that was then, and this is now. And so the Lord, um, graciously, as we prayed as a board and as a congregation, looking for that, that pastor that, uh, that he had for the next era of San Jacinto Assembly, he uh, pointed us to a, to a man who was uh, out in L.A. County. And uh, I, I don't think uh, the Lord had told Pastor Jeff yet what was going to happen. Because if he had, he probably would have left. But <laughs> in 2009, uh, we got Pastor Jeff and Donna Johnson as our pastors. Now, unfortunately, Pastor Jeff couldn't be here today. He sent a clone in a suit. <laughs> I know that because I know Pastor Jeff would never wear a suit like that. But... Uh, Pastor Jeff uh, actually grew up uh, as a PK, that's a preacher's kid, uh, in Canada, and uh, went to school in Canada and uh, got his training in Canada. Um, and as a young man, uh, he slipped across the border, and, uh, <laughs> and he ended up in a uh, hot, dusty agricultural community of Bakersfield. And there he was youth pastor and, and served on the, on the other staff positions for a number of years and then the Lord called him to a hot dusty agricultural community um, called Santa Clarita and uh, so he was there and he he was the pastor of a church which is where we finally uh, ran into him and met him and so over time then of course God uh, called him to a hot dusty <laughs> agricultural community uh, the San Jacinto there's a pattern here I don't know if you noticed that um, so they came, and they came with uh, McKaylee and Bryce, um, and he began then to, uh, to start pastoring us. And he had a big job to do, because as you know, we had some very great pastors, and, and Gordon and Nons they were, were great pastors, and there were some big shoes to fill, and God knew that. And uh, he brought the right people. He brought the right, the right pastor. There was, uh, there was tough times at the beginning, as you, you may not know that, uh, that for much of the first uh, year, Pastor Jeff had to commute from Santa Clarita to San Jacinto, and then finally ended up living in his, uh, his in-law's motor home for a while. But they finally, finally found a house uh, here, and they found it in the Val Vista area. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to some of you, but see, the Johnsons are the first San Jacinto Assembly pastors to live outside of the city of San Jacinto. Now, there are some people, some sticklers, who, who, who didn't quite understand why that was. And uh, so they, they, they asked, why not live in the city of San Jacinto? Pastor Jeff very graciously encouraged them and told them, get a life. Um, <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> no, I, maybe, no, I'm sorry, you didn't say that. Uh, not out loud, anyway. Um, but look, the, the truth was, McKaylee, who's now going to graduate from college here pretty quick, McKaylee was a, was a competitive swimmer, and there's no pool at San Jacinto High School. And more than that, I mean, and honestly, we've heard some of this already, San Jacinto Assembly is part of this whole valley. You know, I live in, in Hemet. Many of us live in Hemet and other places. This church is a, is a focal point for the whole valley. It's a place for the body of Christ. And so what God did is he brought us a pastor who had a vision not just for San Jacinto, but it's growing. It's growing outside of this valley. He is, and Donna is, they are people for an hour such as this. They're here for now. They have helped to heal a grieving congregation and to bring in many new people. Many of you 
um, have never known a different pastor here than Pastor Jeff, and you're lucky because he's a great man, and so is Donna, great woman of God. They've worked hard. They've gotten the church out of debt, which is a big deal. And what Pastor Jeff did is he brought in a new vision and a new um, spirit and a new feeling to, to what the church needed to do for this new area, uh, the, the new era. He brought in, in the very beginning, some, something that we will never forget, and that is the uh, question of the day. Anybody remember the question of the day? Yes. All of us would get up and go around and ask each other, why do we have to do this? That was the question of the day. But Pastor Jeff was trying to get us out of our comfort zone, trying to get us to interact with one another, get us out of the pews, and that was, that was a good thing. But listen, since then, just in the short time that they've been here, uh, we've heard about all the things that the, the other pastors have done. He has, and, and Pastor Donna has brought in the, the Bring One for Easter service, the, the 2 times 714 prayer movement and prayer app. That, that is now a worldwide phenomenon that people are doing that. Uh, Ruin, are you in uh, a greater focus and more effective missions support ministry? Uh, fusion, this is where we're take, talking to first and second time visitors and beginning to reach out to people that come in so that you feel welcome. Connection cards, our favorite. We love it. Uh, movers, this is the ministry of volunteers again. You can't run a church with one person, two people, five people. A church like this requires a lot of volunteers, and it requires actually all of us to be part of the body, and so that has been moved forward. Scrip, which is paid for a lot of the youth ministry and other things. Uh, we have parented other churches. We've helped other churches with uh, all kinds of different um, uh, support mechanisms, affinity groups, and as was pointed out, the baccalaureate service is now open to all of the uh, high schools in the whole valley. So, Pastor Jeff, we're very glad that you're here. Uh, you and Donna, and you are here for such a time as this, whether you want it to be or not, um, you are here. So I do I want to take just a second. I want to bring Mark Bartell, if he's here, Scott Miller, come back up. We have a proclamation. Uh, we got a problem. I can't read this. I don't have any glasses. Oh, I'm blind. Easy on? Easy. We'll give it a shot. This uh, proclamation uh, of the city council of the city of San Jose. Oh, man, get over here. Get dressed up. Come on, come must be the second coming of Christ today. If you're not ready, look the part. <laughs> I'm not going to read the whereas. Um, but anyway, uh, local churches have played an important role in the life and history of uh, America for forever. Yeah. <laughs> I can't read this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whereas the San Jacinto Assembly of God Church has played an integral part of the history of San Jacinto since the inception of the charter, July 11th, 1939. This charter, charter making San Jacinto Assembly of God Church one of the largest standing organizations in the history of the city of San Jacinto. Whereas the city of San Jacinto... I'm sorry, whereas the San Jacinto Assembly of God Church has always strived to be a positive influence on the families and communities of San Jacinto. Whereas the San Jacinto Assembly of God Church has spent many years providing community outreach programs such as neighborhood cleanup, San Jacinto High School football breakfast, Thanksgiving turkey giveaways, police department care packages, fall festival community outreaches, and food distributions to the needy, among many other contributions to the city. Now, therefore, let it be known that the city council of the city of San Jacinto does proclaim Sunday, September 14th, 2014, 
as San Jacinto Assembly of God Day in the city of San Jacinto, California to honor 75 years of dedicated service. <laughs> signed by the mayor, signed by the mayor of San Jacinto, Alonzo Ledesma, Mayor Pro Tem Crystal Ruiz, and the rest of the council, on behalf of the city council and the city of San Jacinto, I'm going to kill him. Him with glasses and we, me with microphones. On behalf of the city of San Jacinto, it is my honor to present our senior pastor, Jeff Johnson, proclaiming today San Jacinto Assembly of God Day in the city of San Jacinto. That's awesome, huh? You look good. <laughs> So, so does this get us all a discount at taco shop afterwards? <laughs> like we show them the deal, we get 15% off. and Only for senior pastors. Fantastic. All right. Very good. I don't know whose phone that might be. They may want that. And there we go. Thank you. All right. Well, great. Thank you. Well, what a, what a big day. And uh, this I, it was out in the lobby, and they're going to be using it for a photo booth afterwards. But I, you're not kidding. That thing's heavy. All right, there's going to be like four of us. This is going to remind me of a joke here in a minute. All right, that's perfect. And, um, but we thought orange was cool back a, a whole lot of years ago. Every church I walked in was this color, and, and, and I'm glad today that it's no longer that color. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's an honor to stand here as your pastor today, and uh, I do want to thank the committee for doing a... Uh, a, a really great job, and it's a thankless job, and it was uh, over some months of coming together and, and, and pulling this together, and so uh, a tribute to them and their hard work today. And we, we've had a chance to look back, and what a great legacy SJA has had, complete. And that what, what is very interesting and unique is that they've had two long-term pastors. That is very out of the ordinary. You have to know that, uh, both in the coffees. And who couldn't like a pastor with the last name of Coffee? I mean, seriously, don't you just love that guy already? I mean, it, coffee. And, um, and, and then, of course, uh, the Houston's following up after them. And so a very unique sense, uh, some tw or 40, 40 years of ministry uh, with the last two. And so coming in uh, to follow after that was certainly a very real challenge. I remember when um, we came here back those years, my dad, who'd been in ministry, still in ministry, um, he said, okay, Jeff, here's the deal. Uh, be prepared for uh, uh, some of the toughest times of your whole entire ministry. Now, I'm not saying that to, to concern you or worry anything else, but you see, when you follow very successful and, 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 and prime leadership moving at a very good speed, breakneck speed in many times, um, you know, certain things will change. And, and in the transition uh, especially with the Houstons in, in, in that time and then in the worst economy uh, that you and I have ever experienced, um, it was a rough go out the gate, and I'm not afraid to say that. It was a rough go, not people-wise, but just everything was going on in a very strange way within this community. And now we, uh, we pause because, you see, we can't live in the past. We can honor it, but we don't live there. And we can, we can see the present, and, and in the present we can look at, uh, you know, with a, a very real eye as to the conditions and, and what's going on in the immediate. But now we must look to the future. And as we look to the future, recognizing that, that in this day and age of, of church life, you know, in our nation today, we close more churches every year than we open. And so a church to reach 75 years of age is nothing really short of remarkable. And so uh, the other challenge of a church of, of 75 years is still to be vibrant. And, and, and that is what SJA is. There's still a vibrancy and there's a life here in this place that, uh, that God has uh, conditioned us and prepared us for this reason today. And you know what? The history is wonderful. But going forward, God is going to continue to write history because of your involvement and in what he wants to do through you here for this community today. 
See, there's an incredible story that comes out uh, for us in the late 1400s. There's a block of marble, and, and this block of marble was deemed flawed and, and useless, and by the artisans was, was, was kind of put aside. And every sculptor who looked at it saw it as too long or, or, or too narrow and not useful for whatever project they were working on. And it sat there for some 40 years off to the side. And finally, in 1501, a 26-year-old man happened by the block of marble, and, and he saw something very different. He had a greater vision for the block of marble. Inside this formless mass of stone, this young sculptor saw the heroic beauty and grace and wonder of a man who would become known as David. See, young Mike, uh, Michelangelo famously said, I already saw David inside. I only had to release him by chipping away at the marble already trapped, that had trapped him in. You know, it is said that we are, we are not limited by our, by our abilities or our current circumstances. We are only limited by our vision of what, of what can be. A vision is not just a picture of what could be. It is an appeal to be better together. A call to do something more than even our great history has shown us. See, one person sees a, a rock pile and another sees a great cathedral. And the difference in that is, is vision. And as someone that, um, I can say this unashamedly, that spends, um, spends time in the Word of God, there's a pattern that emerges from Scripture that, um, that applies to us today as, as His church. See, Abraham, because he honored God, became the father of nations. In Israel, when they walked in harmony and in obedience to the call of God on their lives, so much blessing would f flow through their, through, through their nation that those other nations that aligned with them would f know the blessing and would be under the protection of the Lord as well. And our history is filled with fantastic stories. You know, there are stories of, of dramatic healings from this congregation that we didn't even get to today. There are stories of lives that were forever changed because they gave their heart to Lord, the Lord at the altar. And at that altar, a family was changed. And then from there, they went out and did what God had called them to do. And those are, those are tremendous things. And those things continue to be written today and changed lives. And, and the involvement in the community, this is the common theme. This church has had a um, has had a model that has been replicated by many as to how to move forward and building a solid foundation within a community. And it's that foundation which is key for us today to continue to move forward. Today or this weekend is a very interesting weekend. One of the ministries that was started very uh, many years ago, the, the ministry at La Vista, took a, a step forward yesterday. It's something they called Recovery Sisters. You see, ministries are never to stay completely the same. Ministries are to continue to grow and, and to mold and shape and fulfill greater purpose. And, and yesterday, uh, as Jeannie was explaining to me by way of email, that just a, a wonderful start, a ministry that started to, 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 to a home here that houses ladies that, uh, that are trying to get a, a, a control of their lives, now is taken on a different area where inviting ladies back that have graduated that program and program helping provide accountability and an ongoing way of support to move forward. I'm very, very proud of that. Some of you weren't here to see the slide presentation, but it'll be in the, it'll be in the, um, in the box following the service today. But you saw the, the launching of the Spanish ministry today uniquely. This is how God is so good in his timing today. They take a, a really big step forward in their ongoing growth. You see, a couple of years ago, we entered into an agreement with them because we recognize that this is a congregation. This is not just a, a ministry of this church, but this is a growing congregation with an opportunity to uh, fill a very real need within our community. And so we entered into, along with the ministry uh, leaders and our administrative leaders and Pastor Juan, uh, and we, we moved into what is called a parenting relationship with with our Spanish congregation. And over the last several months, they have begun to act what I call, as, as, or best explained, as a full-service congregation. You see, when you, are when you are part of a ministry, there's only certain elements that you have to care for. 
but they are taking steps towards becoming more full service. In other words, they begin to provide their own child care. They run perhaps at a different schedule. As a matter of fact, today they will begin their service at 1130 and not coincide with our existing service that starts here at 10 o'clock. They're taking steps forward, and, and uh, we dream of the day where it, they get so large they can no longer be housed in that building. They either have to use our sanctuary in the afternoon, or they go out and find uh, a, a, another building, and, and, and some will go, well, that would be terrible. No, we'll, we'll, we'll plant another one, and we'll do it again, you see? And so today, they're taking very real steps of moving forward. And those ministries are a part of a, a larger whole. So what does God have uniquely for San Jacinto of God? We honor the past. We don't live in it. We look forward with a very present eye to today. I'm not going to kid you. There is a tremendous challenge ahead, especially since this church has thrived through much of its 75-year history. And so there's a cue from Scripture, a few cues, that I want to give to us briefly this morning. With such a rich history, there's a, there's a temptation to repeat that which has been done before. Make it a little more contemporary and, and call it good. To me, that's akin to pouring new wine into old wineskins out of Luke chapter 5. Eventually, that which is old can no longer hold that which is new, and, and it ruptures, and it fully wastes its contents. And while it seems safe not to rock the boat or, and just rinse and repeat, all that we do, the power and the presence of God is lost because our hope is placed in what was and not in what's ahead. And as messy as it is to bust those old wine skids, equally important is to respect and honor that which makes the church different and a different environment from that of a local business or running a household. The church is not a fad, and our identity is not to be defined on, by what others are doing, but what God has called us to do. In Leviticus chapter 10, we are introduced to something called holy fire. In the inauguration of the traveling tabernacle of the Lord, the sacrifices placed on the altar of burnt offering were accepted by the Lord, and it was consumed by fire that came from the very throne room of God. This was no ordinary fire. It was sacred fire, holy fire from God himself. And the same fire was then used to burn the incense that was taken into the tabernacle to the altar of incense. Moses and Aaron were not only preserved by God's holy fire, but were able to bless the people because of it. But not everyone understood what was so holy about this. And in fact, Aaron's sons disregarded the solemn instruction that they had been given in regard to the, the holy fire and, and, and filled their censers with fire that did not originate from the holy fire or of the altar of burnt offering. They entered the tabernacle with, a, with a, a common fire that afforded them no protection and they instantly died. This was such a serious violation that the, that the people of God were not even allowed to mourn their death because they had greatly grieved God. Aaron's sons, in fact, had been drunk, and the reasoning was impaired, and they could no, see no reason to bother with getting the coals from the sacred fire of the, burnt, uh, burnt, uh, of the altar burnt offering. They did not discern the difference between the holy and the unholy, between the unclean and the clean. Common, unholy fire probably looked no different to them, and surely it would burn the incense in their censers too, right? Who cares, they thought. In their drunken stupor, it wouldn't matter to God what fire was presented. It can't be that particular. So they offered God that which was common instead of what was holy, as God required. They paid with their lives for their drunken obedience. For us, J.A., we are giving key examples as to what not to do. We do not lean on the common, but we seek after that fire. Fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit who drives and, 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 and moves us forward and cleanses us in the purifying nature of fire. And God does not want to leave us, leave us confused or misguided, but wants to give us a hope. Zechariah 4, 6, and the, the most famous part of this verse is familiar. It says, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. 
you know, one of the things that I love about SJA is that the fact that it is, it is very unique. And although we are of, of thousands of churches in this nation, we, we have some very interesting DNA. We are young and old. We are racially mixed and economically diverse. We have new believers and mature ones with coming from different tribes and different names and denominations. And in a community, we're placed in a community with great many challenges and concerns. The Spirit of God is symbolized, like I said, by fire, and, and for SJA to move forward in his calling, we need the fire of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, folks. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn in our lives and not be comfortable with what is common. The Apostle Paul reminds us this way, 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers and in the world, to abstain from the sinful desires, to abstain from the common, which war against your soul. I love how the New Living puts it. You are temporary residents and foreigners. I believe God's purposes and vision are fulfilled in us as we remain keyed into his leading. And a proper understanding of how and why he blesses us keeps us from falling for the common or habitual. About a year ago, I started to share what I believe God has for us at SJA. You know, sometimes when God speaks to you, you think you're crazy. You start to wonder, how is that possible? It was in the middle of the Blessed Life series, and that was a, it was a turnaround series for us as a church last year when we walked through those. It was about a year ago today. We started in the middle of September of last year. And we walked through that, and we discovered that that, that which we do in regards to stewardship is, is, is perhaps um, there was more that God was leading us into. And, and as God was showing me and, 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 and leading me in that series, he began to speak to me about this idea. And I, I even let it slip out very early on in that series where I said something along this lines that I believe that God has called SJA to be a church that blesses this community and that economic, and here's where it got big, the, the blessing of the community, no big deal, that history is laid, it's done well, and we can continue to do this, but this was the big deal, and that economic renewal would flow through this body into this valley. Now that is big. What does that mean? I have no idea. But I have some thoughts. You see, I believe that, that in this body, there is a dynamic economic force that is waiting to spill out and that it touches. We have bought the, 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 the flashlights and the helmets and, and those things, and those are, those are fantastic things. And those are all things that, that any church that, that, that is, is, is just thinking needs to be a part of, to be actively involved, to, to be a hand extended. As Ken said so well, you see a need, you, you fill it, and, and, you, and you reach down and you lift up, and that's all very, very important. But now I believe God is taking us to the next level of what that means. And as impossible as it sounds, I believe with all of my heart that God wants to position this church in its near future to be a part of the solution that absolutely plagues the valley in which we live in today. We lament about two things in our valley today, that there's no jobs and that we lose our youngest and our best. And they go off to college as they should consider, uh, continue their education, but most do not return. And I believe that that will change. Because we begin to listen to what God has called us to be about. I believe it can be so. I believe in all my heart. Again, how does that happen? I'm not sure. But it's not by 
might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, you see. Because as God begins to outpour, the opportunities begin to move forward. And it also then comes to you and I. Do you realize that each of us has a responsibility in which to play in this regard? Each of us have been called to pick up this challenge and to run with it and see what God wants to do in our lives. You see, Economic renewal will flow through this church, and as we purpose ourselves to give and invest in our community, I believe he will pour out so much blessing that we will be that part of Scripture that says it'll just be running over. There will be so much, there will be no shortage. He did it in the life of Abraham. He provided through Israel, and he can and he will do it through us. I could give you uh, plans and ministries, things today, but that's not what vision's about. Vision is about grabbing onto something that you and I can't do in the natural today and saying, and saying this, with God, all things are possible, right? And with God, we have to believe in crazy dreams. If we say, with God, he can only heal the cold, then we say we believe in a weak God, not a strong God. But today, I believe in a strong God, not a weak God. See, today, we have to take God out of the box that we put, it on, put him in and begin to believe that the dreams and that which he has laid in the foundation for are for us to build on, not to neglect or to, or to kind of go, well, that was then, not now, but recognize, as Pastor Scott, that he has moved us forward for a time such as this. So taking God out of the box and beginning to see something amazing that can happen, and I believe it can. And I believe that there is someone sitting in here today that is being inspired of the Holy Spirit, that God is giving you an idea that will bring hundreds and hundreds of jobs right here to this valley. And again, that sounds crazy to some of you, but I know some of you think this way and you pray this way. Okay, God, if we can't get the jobs, then use me to bring jobs here. And why is that important? Because there is a hurting community here and jobs and coming alongside to touch people are all a part ministering to the needs of our community. And I believe what will happen here is we have godly men and women that are, that are business owners and that are entrepreneurs and seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jobs coming here. And then you know what will happen? our kids will have something to return to you see they'll be able to come back and they'll be able to invest in the community that has raised them and we will not keep sending them off to other places and everywhere else but they will come and they will be a part of this valley and the solution of seeing the power of God to be just be able to meet the, the just the basic core essentials that we lament that seem to be missing from the fabric of our society I believe God could change this community but it will take an honest, practical step moving forward, and we will begin to have to move in faith to see that all things are possible and that jobs can be restored here, that it will move through here, that our students and our youth. You know, we've got about 1,200 people in this thing called School of Ministry out of the district office, and as much as I love it, I hate it all at the same time because here's the problem. We're training 1,200 people to be in a ministry, and we don't have them in ministry. I would love to see, because of the resources that are coming here, having a full campus of people that are ministry, that are training, that need the mentoring, they need the discipleship. You see, we have some of them already in our midst. When I think about it, Zach DeBolt, who's gone to Australia and has come back and feels like he's called to be the ministry, and he's here, but I see 50 more of them. I see 100 more of them. I see 200 more of them. I see them young, and I see them old. See, folks, we need to begin to dream with God. All things are possible. We've had our eyes very much stuck the last few years on what's broken in our community. But today, if we take our eyes off what is broken and we begin to believe in what God has purposed for us as we move forward. You know what? I've got to shut it down. Spanish church is starting their service. They've got to get into the kids' building. That's part of our transition. And so let me say this in close today. One of the things out of Ephesians that is so key, Ephesians 4.12 says to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. I believe that we do not live in the past, that our future is to find what we do in our present. We must step out in faith, open to new wine and new wineskins. 
We move not in the common, but in the holy. And we should and will expect his provision and blessing to be poured out on our congregation. We're going to sing a, a song in closing today, and I just want to direct your attention very quickly to this connection card. We're going to sing a song. It's a fantastic song. Thrive. That's what God has called us to be. Thrive today. If you've got prayer requests, we certainly would welcome those today. If you're a guest with us today, you could let us know. Mark that off. But on the back side, I want to remind you, where have you been? Where are you now? And are you going with us today and some more? You see, it's not my vision. It's God's vision. It's what God has placed in my heart. I just get the honor of sharing it. And he's inviting all of us to come together to see something amazing happen in this valley. So if you've got those connection cards ready, you can start filling those out. We'll collect them immediately following this song as we sing together. God bless you. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love. 
Thank you. 